Today, I want to talk about a film that you've probably heard of called Fargo, directed by Joel Cohen of the Cohen Brothers. It came out in 1996. It stars William H. Macy, Francis McDormand, uh, Steve Buscemi, and a couple of other names that I'm forgetting right now. I've seen it before many times throughout the years, but I've seen it at sort of different ages, you know, one time in film school and then another time a couple of years ago. And then today I just saw it on Amazon and I was like, well, you know, maybe I'll give this a shot and see, uh, see if I still like it, see if it still retains my interest. And, you know, in conclusion, I would say that this film has very a very high replay value it is paced in such a way that it moves the story along and but also simmers on the details of this you know rural minnesota culture that you know people can say that it pokes fun at but i really think it's sort of an ode an homage to that culture and it's not coming from mockery it's actually in my opinion it's coming from a place of love whether it was the uh, buffets um, whether it was just even the dialect and and the you know fascination with hockey as like the sport in William H Macy's uh, case in his character he has this sort of veneer of being fake polite in front of you but then actually having malicious intentions um, behind the scenes and that uh, the evilness and the moral bankruptness of his character is contrasted by uh, Frances McDormand who her character named Margie uh, is kind of you know they're uh, the polar opposites like where, where she is I don't know I guess just motivated um, by just doing her job the best she can and I guess um, having a loving relationship with Norm, her husband, which, you know, in the scenes that showcase them, it's, it's just like the most healthy relationship that you could see on screen. It, they both, ha you know, support each other. Norm is waking up in the middle of the night to fix her some eggs. And, you know, she as well, likewise, encourages him to paint all this to say that I think the Coens do a really good job of building a world that you can feel immersed in as a viewer uh, with its specificities in characters, in set design, and just dialogue as well. It doesn't feel um, wedged in there as somebody who hasn't been around that culture in a sense. N not that I'm an expert on all things Minnesota, but it certainly didn't seem fabricated to me. Uh, it didn't seem like this like copy paste um you know they really did their research it, it really comes across and you know if you look at their other films uh the first one that comes to mind is burn after reading the amusement comes from the little quirks that they write within the characters and of course the conflicts that um are introduced because of the you know characters wants uh for seemingly a, a better life and in that case with burn after reading which i can dissect separately in a you know separate video but like the presence of washington dc informs what their motivations are and sort of the espionage that happens within that film in particular but with fargo even just the presence of the snow plays sort of a separate character in itself uh it rep you know, in many scenes you see it uh, shown in sort of this isolating, as this isolating setting. Uh, there's that one sort of infamous shot of William H. Macy going to his car um, after probably, you know, just feeling utterly disgruntled. He goes to his car, but the, it's shot in a very like um, bird's eye view of him in an empty parking lot with just the car in view. And so it just shows this sort of barren landscape. Same could be said when Steve Buscemi's character is burying the money later on in the film. And he looks to his left, he looks to his right, and there's nothing to be seen for, you know, miles on end. The William H. Macy's character and how disgruntled his life is as a, 
you know, executive sales director at a used car lot of which his father-in-law owns. So not only does he loathe his job, but he loathes the fact that his father-in-law has this control over him and also just wants to, wants out. He wants a, he's desperately pleading for somewhat of a better life, but uh, he soon realizes as the film goes on that it doesn't come at a small price and that he is the bystander of many sort of innocent deaths, which makes me think within the film, it's this mix of very wholesome moments showing just the local townspeople of Minnesota, but then also just really funny moments, specifically with Steve Buscemi, who I think steals the show in this case because his character is con the complete opposite of the rest of the town, uh, the rest of the town's people in Minnesota. He is unfiltered in his speech and in his behavior, and he's just wholly erratic. And everybody else um, has this, you know, banter between each other where it's very, um, surface level but very as least egregious as possible they tr keep it, their conversation their dialogue the the temperament at least pretty mild but Buscemi given that he is a henchman is just coming out um buck wild he very much does not think before he speaks and he operates very much on emotion which the same can't be said about his partner in crime, Gruyere, uh, who's played by Peter Stormar. Uh, he has this bleach blonde hair and these dead eyes and he smokes cigarettes in such a way where he um, smokes it not with his you know, two fingers like this, but he's almost cradling the cigarette as he's pulling drags from it. The, between the two of them, they couldn't be any more different, you know? Um, Gruyere, he's kind of um, keeps to himself, but you know when he when he wants to make an impression, he uh, it usually ends in bloodshed. Whereas, you know, Buscemi is all over the place, and he's kind of um, the mouthpiece between the two, and that friction is sort of built throughout the film, and ultimately ends up in a wood chipper, which. Um, by all accounts goes to the sort of brutality of the film is that it's just it's it's quite uh yeah it's quite graphic but uh not in, not only in the wood chipper uh instance but then also with just you know when the cop pulls him over you see just full on his head just get you know blown off and then even with steve buscemi getting hit you know with a bullet in his head as well um you know they don't hold back from that um which almost is uh i guess part of the cohen brothers style specifically i guess with joel cohen in this case is their style of not you know holding back on the sort of violence that happens within their stories uh but like i said to kind of put a button on the point is that this film will weave through wholesome moments, especially with Marge and, and her husband. You'll have some just genuinely hilarious moments of just, whether it's William H. Macy, just where his plan is unfolding and he's sort of freaking out, or Steve Buscemi, who, you know, things are not working out with him as well. Like just their reactions of just um, acting, you know, over the top, I think for me, definitely made me laugh also another moment that I found sort of funny was just to show the incompetence of uh, Steve Buscemi's character as he's breaking into um, Jerry's house where his wife is just watching this home cooking show um, while knitting you know he's peering through the window in a ski mask uh, but you hear the home cooking show in the background I just felt that contrast was uh, just another touch of the uh, com comedy within this film. Yet, as much as there's levity within the film, it does uh, maintain a certain degree of drama, uh, especially when you hear that opening score and then you hear it played, um, you know, more towards the uh, later in the film. It sounds 
pretty sort of ominous and and sort of uh, induces a sense of mystery of you know what's to occur and especially with just like the barrenness of the snowscape I think um, that you know theme of this uh, of the music in particular really uh, just shows that something grim is going to occur and it kind of cues you as a viewer that okay well you know Fargo is um, probably going to be at the center of some you know heinous uh, act and speaking about just how morally sort of bankrupt Jerry is as a character I think one of the moments that stood out to me for this was when he is talking to his son about you know his mom who's just been kidnapped and his son is just uh, act reacting appropriately you know he's in shock and he's worried about her but he's saying no no everything's gonna be okay you know we're gonna figure this out but obviously Jerry is the one that initiated the plan but just him doing that to his son and just trying to save face as it's just uh, it was just truly such a a very pathetic and um, you know ugly gesture on his part I think another one of these quirks that I mentioned before uh, when it relates to Steve Buscemi's character is his incessant need to be stimulated um, we see this in the uh, car ride with him and his partner and his partner obviously is you know chooses to be very quiet on purpose but you know Steve is haranguing him like you know you we've been driving I've been driving I've been putting all this work you know I just want some small talk to lift my spirits and obviously he doesn't get what he wants and then I found that um, sort of connected with him later when they're out in their hideout in um, Twin Falls and the TV that they have is obviously not working. He's trying to futz with the antenna. He's banging on the TV. And I think it just goes to that same um, need for him just to be kind of uh, stimulated. And I, and, and I think it's just another um, little sort of detail of his character that makes him um, just someone that is, um, I don't know, just sort of, uh, it, it's consistent with his character is kind of what my point would be. And there are, you know, little details about these characters that uh, reveal much more about how their lives are just sort of in the gutter. And as it relates to Jerry and, you know, what motivates him to sort of act uh, in such a desperate uh, plea for, you know, seemingly a better life with more money is uh, this reoccurring detail that comes with him trying to upsell customers at the car lot for this uh, sealant and it's shown in like this like uh, you know customer interaction with the customers yelling at him it's like we agreed on a price and he's saying no 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 you know he's trying to defuse the situation and and then they show later in the film where I think he has a similar sort of interaction where it's less erratic from the customer standpoint but the customer just says like I don't really care about that like you know that thing and you know that the thing that you're trying to sell me on so it just goes to show like how bad he is at his job but more so like how it's just something that is clearly not sustainable for him which makes him enter this you know crime spree in another instance of just how funny this movie is uh, whether the, it was intentional or not and it's something that I think uh, I left as well in The Sopranos when it happened uh, was the scene of just uh, Buscemi getting uh, hit um, with a belt uh, by the uh, character who works at the car lot as a mechanic. Uh, once The mechanic who sort of uh, introduced the henchman to Jerry, uh, once he feels like his sort of life was in jeopardy given that he had a prior crime history, he just reacts in such anger and finds Buscemi, who is in the midst of having sex with an escort, just drags him off of her and then just start just whipping him with a belt or whatever. I don't know if it was meant to sort of induce like, uh, like I don't know if it was a serious moment, but if it wasn't, it, I think it worked out well because it's just like, it, it's, it's sort of 
defaming and demasculating uh, Buscemi in that moment who uh, is you know obviously reacting and sort of like horror and shrieks and I don't know to me I just found it uh, kind of funny. One little detail that I uh, found sort of ironic uh, that I noticed this time around was Gael, uh, Peter Stormer's character uh, and the way that he was uh, shot by um, Margie uh, in the back is kind of ironic when you consider uh, what he did to the peep to the car that drove past him after they shot the cop you know he went after that car as they flipped over in the snow and the one guy in the red is in the mo official movie poster when he's trying to run away from uh, Gaier he gets shot in the back so I just found whether it was an intentional or not, that uh, the same act that he did inflicted onto the eyewitness is the same. Uh, he received the same fate as uh, as him when um, he was eventually tracked down by uh, Marge uh, in the snow in in the hideout. And so those are my thoughts on the film. I felt that just the details that the Cohen brothers did within the writing made for a world that was very entertaining and uh, characters with motivations that um, were easy to follow but also uh, very funny at moments uh, specifically with Buscemi and William H. Macy whose lives were <clears throat> pretty pathetic but they still thought the whole time that they could get away with it. Um, moments like that and then just also how I felt it was uh, sort of a dedication to the culture within the Midwest in a sense. Um, how it was not sort of poking fun at them but it instead felt very endearing. All those elements combined definitely made this film worth the watch uh, and is now available on Amazon. I don't know how long because if we live in the age of streaming so nothing's permanent so you know if you have this cop and you own it it's probably uh, that was probably a good purchase to do in my opinion. So yeah thank you for watching uh, I appreciate it and I'll talk to you soon. Bye.